Hello and welcome to our December Arkansas Farm to School Network conversation that's focused on the topic of farmers selling to schools. Today we're joined by Echo Barnhill from Barnhill Orchards and Sean Pissera with Heifer Ranch to talk all about how they connect with schools, grow their produce, and make sure that kids have healthy foods in school. Echo is the sales and marketing representative representative from Barnhill Orchards. Um, and this is a farm that's family run and was established in the 1980s in Lono County. Echo handles a lot of the paperwork and outreach to schools and restaurants, as well as manages the on-farm sales and they have a farm corner market. And when COVID-19 started, that corner market became really crucial and was converted to a drive-through and handled a lot of online sales as well. Also, Echo is responsible for their food safety program, handles all their advertising on Facebook and Instagram, and of course, participates in all the important activities like harvesting, cleaning, and packing um, for their farmers markets and, and assisting in farm planning and production activities. Echo, I'm going to pass it to you. I was thinking, I sound very busy, don't I? <laughs> Just busy enough, right? Yeah. All right, well, let me um, say a little bit about the farm to school program. I've been, uh, I guess, handling that aspect for about at least five or six years. And uh, I started out going to various different uh, schools. And I, this was kind of before it was popular. And I would do a lot of cold calls or, and just show up at uh, schools and visit their uh, child nutrition directors and kind of introduce myself. Hey, this is who I am. This is what I can bring you. Uh, what do you think? Some schools, it was a brand new concept too. And, uh, and we had to work through it together. Other, other schools were already online and were like, hey, great, you're here. What do you have? So I was going to run through, um, I, I did a little, made some notes and um, we're going to go through a few things. And if you have any questions, go ahead and ask me. Um, I know Sean's going to cover some more of these points when he does uh, his as well. Uh, why, why our farm to school is good for the school? One is their produce is fresh. The kids are eating what's local and what's seasonal, and they really learn that everything that they are going to get is not from Walmart, because there's always that concept, you know, or you know, uh, how do you pick a potato off a tree? I've had so many questions about produce where kids just don't know where their produce comes from, and it supports us, the local farmers. All right, so it's also good for the farm. Um, it sustains us financially through the winter. And that's a good thing for the farmers that can grow produce during the winter that have high tunnels. If you don't have a high tunnel or the ability to grow something that's gonna grow all winter, this becomes a tough program because school starts in the fall all through the winter and then in the early spring and it stops. So unfortunately, we aren't able to provide them all of our great summer produce that really doesn't work. And it, I've never been able to push through a program for like summer school. That's never really worked for me either. It's always been during the school year and it's always during the winter. So that becomes an, an issue. Um, and it's good advertisement for your on farm sales or for your farmer's market. So if you're trying to get your name out there, working with schools is always good because usually the school administrators and the nutrition director will make some efforts to get your farm name out there and get your name out there. So it's kind of a win-win all the way around and you're giving back to the community. So that's a good thing too. Um, the schools that we currently support are Searcy and BB. Um, I've gone as far as I used to do Cabot and Lone Oak and North Little Rock and I was kind of expanding myself out a little bit too far. Uh, getting too many commitments and going. So I've kind of just kind of gone down to the uh, schools that are local then with the administrators that I work with very well. And that's kind of worked out well for me. Um, so you're saying, what kind of produce do the schools want? I usually bring a list of everything that I have or what I'm able to produce for them. And the thing that the school has to remember is that we can't just I can't say, hey, I, I can provide you lettuce. And then they call me up, say a week ahead of time and say, okay, we're ready for our lettuce. Unless I know early on, say like um, uh, early summer, so I can plant for the fall or fall for the winter, I'm not gonna be able to do this. But in general, the produce that we provide to schools is the lettuce. We have a couple of pear trees. We don't have a lot, but we have some. We have watermelon and cantaloupe. Our biggest one is probably strawberries and lettuce. We will bring in potatoes and then um, in the fall, we'll do some squash, some yellow, yellow and zucchini squash. Um, what are my challenges? And that's probably, this is probably a pretty important concept to hit 
is uh, a lot of the area schools are not familiar with the farm to school program. They've heard about it, but they've never participated in it. So um, that's my job is to go in and educate them on that. And like I said, it, it's an education both for the school and the farmer. And what I found out is that I can go in and say, hey, I've got strawberries or I've got peaches and they're like, great, bring them on. But then when I say, hey, I've got squash and zucchini and okra and uh, or, you know, other or you know, any other winter squashes or things like that, they're like, oh, I don't know. You, you know, so they're not as because a lot, of, a lot of the vegetables have to be cut up and they have to be processed. And a lot of the schools, they don't have, especially the larger the school, the less time they have to cut up produce like that. So if you can give them something that they can eat without much processing, say like a strawberry, they really, that works out really well. Uh, my challenges are getting to know information ahead of time, like a season before. Uh, I need, would need to know that. And uh, challenge also reliable transportation, getting to the schools. Setting prices is always a challenge. Um, for instance, uh, let's just say if you have a lettuce and that's a good, a lettuce is a good crop to sell schools because they want fresh lettuce and it's a good winter crop. And uh, they'll say, well, you know, I can buy it from Cisco. I can get 24 heads of lettuce for $15. And I'm like, well, you know, there's no way I can do that. So my, my point to you would be is you need to know what your price point is and go into them with the price that's going to make you a profit and make it and benefit you as a farmer. Uh, Cause you're not in the business just, to, you know, I guess you could do it to break even, but you need to make a little bit of money on what you do. So you need to know your price points on your products and they may or may not want that. And if they don't, you need to move on to another product that will work for them and work for you. Not every product is going to work. Not every, you know, fruit or vegetable is going to work. Um, uh, and then the packing specific quantities, because they might say, well, uh, you know, you got to know, do I, am I going to sell this by the pound? Are we going to sell it by the box? Is it going to be by the cart? You know, you have to, that's kind of a challenge also, because you're kind of talking apples and oranges. They get products in big boxes and you're going to sell them by the pound. It's hard, hard for them to compare. So you got to work through that. All right, so how do you find your local school? Well, fortunately, you guys have Sarah now. Sarah's come along and she has been a great conduit to pointing, pointing the farmer in the right direction to the schools that are closest to them and schools that are interested and in what products are interested in. So that works out good. And if you've got a school area by you, just drop in, make an appointment, call them, talk with your school nutrition director and um, say, hey, I'd like to come in and talk to you. And I'll go in through just a minute as to what you bring in. Best best bet is just be your own, uh, be your own. I don't know, speaker. You know, you go forward and you find it. Uh, and then the other thing is, is how far are you willing to drive? I kind of got involved with going to Conway one time, and uh, they were great people up there. But I realized pretty quick off that I didn't want to drive to Conway. North Little Rock was actually doable, but even that was a little bit of a disc, too much for me. And you know, with all the city driving and all that stuff. So you got to know what your limitations are before you go out and see a school. All right, so let's just say you have a meeting and you, you've gotten set up or you're going, you've contacted the director or, and, or, they've, or they've called a bunch of local farmers in. That happens too sometimes. So you're thinking, okay, what do I need to bring with me? I used to bring a, a packet in a, in a binder or in a folder and I would leave that with them. I, I would write a little paragraph about my farm, bring some photos or even samples. That worked out good. One, one time I brought in a, a box of lettuce to, uh, and, and I did not get to leave with that box of lettuce. They had already divided it up and it was gone before I could even get out the door. So they like samples. And I think Sarah has for you a copy of a seasonal chart of what you have and when it'll be available. That's what's really helpful for the schools because they've got to make their menus out um, actually beginning of the school year or before. So they need to know who you are, what you have and how they can get you into their schedule. You want to bring your prices, so kind of have that figured out. What, what, you know, is it by the box, by the pound, by the each? What, how is it? Bring a W-9 form with you. It's always good to have an invoice sheet as to how you plan to submit your payments to them so you can see what you're, what, what you're going to do. You bring with you any food safety certificates. Of course, um, for us, it would be your um, attending the uh, food safety program. 
if you have any other ones, like if you've gotten GAP certified, that's always good. But I don't think very many farmers right now, especially small produce farmers do that. But so for sure your food safety and you need to have some product liability insurance. So, okay. All right, so this is a picture of uh, our chart of what I would bring to the schools. I started in, as you can look at it, in early May. And I just, and, and I don't just say May, I go early, middle and late so that they can know, okay, I got you like the first week, the second, third weeks, and then the fourth week. So I do that all the way through the entire, uh, well, actually this one doesn't work for the school. This would actually be for my summer, but I would do the same thing for the winter time. Um, Maybe this was for summer school, I don't know. But anyway, it always works. Put your produce down when it's available. And that's a really good, helpful kind of a chart to use to uh, bring with you to the meetings. Or, or you may have to email it to them if you can't go to the meeting. If it's all, you, everything's electronic now, so you can always make everything an attachment and send it on to them. Okay. Um, so let's just say you go to the meeting and everything goes good and uh, they say, hey, we really want to start working with you guys. Uh, we want some, some, some of your great produce. So you're going to iron out some details. And actually, these are all pretty important. And there's a lot, there's a lot to it. So, uh, so how are you going to communicate with your nutritional director for the orders? You know, text you, phone calls, emails. Uh, and how's the billing going to be done? Uh, are they going to uh, pay you each time you make a delivery? Some farmers kind of need that. Or can you just get paid once a month or every two weeks? You got to come up with a plan. Um, and I always get stuck with, you know, where do you drop off the invoice? So I've got one schools where I have to go, uh, I have to drop one off to every school that I go to. And another one says, hey, just drop me off one at the central station and we're good. So you got to get that down. And where will you deliver? Uh, I've, I've had several options of both of these. Uh, one of them is a central location where you drop everything off in one spot and then they deliver it. That's the best thing to do. Um, other, other schools, um, you'll be asked to drive around to each school to drop off. And there's usually like five or six schools in each district. And the good thing about that, because I always go to small towns, is um, they're all fairly close by. So it's very doable, but just know it's going to take you more time and energy and issues but you know, so ask which way do they want to have it delivered? And then how do they want it packed? Um, I have found out that a disposable box is the best way to go. Something that you don't have to go back and pick up because they've got a lot of rules in the cafeteria as to how long they can hold boxes and hold your, hold your containers for you. So kind of just plan on it being a disposable option. And uh, when do they want it? And then you, and that's gonna start you with how early in the morning you gotta leave to start getting delivered. Okay, um, and, and, and you're going to want to be kind of good friends with your nutritional director, leastwise be on email and texting terms, because um, your supply can change up and down. Let's say I was going to deliver lettuce over to Cersei this, uh, this next week, and we've just had a hard freeze, and I'm like, whoa, you know what? It's not growing, and some of it doesn't look so good, so my supply can change, so you want to let them know as soon as they can. I have found that they are very, very understanding about it. And, uh, you know, life happens and weather happens. Um, and most of them will order a week ahead of time. So it gives you time to know any, you know, if you need to make a changes and it, it kind of gives you a head start as to, hey, what do I need to start thinking about packing for the next week? And don't hesitate to offer a new product if something else comes available. Let's just say all of a sudden, uh, I, I'm, I, I know I'm going to be going to the school and I've got extra potatoes that come in or squash or something that I hadn't talked to them about or they didn't know I had available. Sometimes they'll make the, the director will make some changes and say, okay, we'll just bring those on or, hey, I'm going to add those in or, hey, I can't do it right now, but how about next week? So it, it, and actually in a good way, it helps farmers with, them with, with the overflow if you have any. Um, and then of course you just let them know if there's any glitches or any issues or problems. Okay. And then that's my old faithful biscuit here at the farm. And that's kind of, I guess, all I have. Does anybody have any questions about farm to school? I was, um, this is Dan Spatz here. I was curious how long uh, Barnyard's been working uh, farm to school and like building up your program. What kind of investment have you put into it? What kind of investment into the farm to school program? Yes, yeah. You know, I'm going to say, 
we probably just keep growing the regular stuff that we grow. We, we, um, we have several points of sale that we do. We do a farmer's markets, a corner market, restaurants, and then farm to school. So when I'll get an order for farm to school, I will just adjust everywhere else around my other four areas. So I don't know that I particularly grow for them unless I know ahead of time that they're gonna say, we're gonna want uh, 10 boxes of lettuce every week from you, then I will up my production. But I've gotta get a commitment from a school before I'm gonna do that. Uh, so I don't know that I really do that much different. If you can't, you're not, uh, what's the best way to say this? I guess it's not a get rich quick program uh, doing the schools. It's almost, I would compare it to uh, if you sell to restaurants, it's very similar to that. You know, they're gonna take maybe um, 20 boxes of lettuce and maybe several, maybe each school will take a box of potatoes and a box and a box of squash, you know, because there's not, you know, you're just a part of their program. You're just a small part of their food program. Um, an important part, but just a small part. So they're really just kind of like a restaurant for us. And it's just, it's, it is a way to have a, a steady stream of income come in. Um, not all schools are very, are good about being consistent. There could be some times where they'll say, when you get to the end of the month or end of the year or end of the whatever, they'll say, you know, we've got a lot of money that's come in from another program. We've got to spend that and we really can't buy from you this week or this month. And then you're kind of like, oh, what am I, you know, then I've got to come up with another, plan, another way to, to sell my produce. I guess just don't put all your eggs in the basket. Most schools are very consistent and they're very good, but you, you also, like the school has to be ready that your plans change, their plans change also. But uh, they're just, I have found them to be a great source of a way to sell my produce in the winter. They are really good for that. And they're really nice people. I haven't met a school, I haven't been to a school yet where I haven't met some of the best people yeah. anywhere the ladies at the cafeteria or the workers at the cafeteria and stuff like that. It sounds like the bread and butter really comes in the summer and it's a nice um, seasonal bridge. Um, for yes. you. Farmers markets, I guess, tend to close in the winter as well too. Yeah. They do, they do. But sometimes farming year round, and that's one other thing to think about is this farming year round, it gets to be a lot for those of you that are, that are working full time. You were working all the time, every day, all the time. And it kind of, if you need a break, it's kind of a little bit tough, you know? I guess maybe you get your Christmas break when those kids are out, but, but anyway, it's a good, Farm to School is a great program. It's a good way to push your pro product and have income during the winter time. That's what I would, and the kids get good food and you're giving, your, you're selling your food. So it's, it's, it's just a win-win all the way. Hey, Echo, that made me wonder a question of, did anything happen when COVID-19 really started back in March? Did you have schools set up at that time and, and something had to be adjusted or I know that you've adjusted your plans and you had that corner corner farm stand so I just wondered how that might have impacted your farm to school sales. Well the, uh, the only schools that I was really delivering to um, since COVID has started pretty much it would be that this last beginning of this year was delivering to Searcy and uh, they've been a great supporter of our farm and uh, not really any different. I would wear a mask and I'd show up to the door and I'll put the, uh, sometimes I would hand the boxes to ladies, but usually I just grab a, uh, a cart, pull the cart out to my truck, fill it up with the boxes and push it in. And then they take it from there. So there was, there's no really any close interaction, but it's still, you know, they're still there. I'm still there. We just wear our mask and do our distancing and, uh, and deliver the produce. So I would, say, I would say the COVID in that respect has not changed for us, for me. Yeah, that's great perspective. Thank you for that. Any other questions for Echo? Feel free to type them in the chat or you can unmute. Yeah, Char Charlotte's there and she, she's our, our director, uh, nutritional director from Searcy and she's really great to work with. If you're anywhere around the area, she is a great contact for you. Well, and Charlotte one time actually at an event we did said specifically that um, and Charlotte, feel free to jump in if you want to share this story, but about how there was um, an E. coli, e. coli breakout a few years ago, and there had been concern from the superintendent on the lettuce, and Charlotte was able to say, no, we're fine. We have our, our lettuce from, from Echo, from Barnhill Orchards. We're safe. Our kids are good. Um, that's another great benefit of Farm to School, of really knowing where your food's coming from. So excited to introduce Sean Passera 
Um, he is the horticultural specialist and garden manager at Heifer Ranch, which is in Perryville, Arkansas. Um, he provides training to regional farmers on sustainable small scale vegetable production and is researching and developing tools and techniques for increased profits and efficiencies. Before farming, Sean worked as an ecologist and an environmental consultant, and he's owned and operated a small beekeeping business for the past eight years and even moved it from Texas to Arkansas. Uh, he's very passionate about building agricultural systems that work for everyone and in concert with the natural ecological systems. So welcome, Sean. Thanks for joining us. So I'll just kind of give an overview. Um, I think where Echo hit the, the marketing side and the uh, sales side, organizational side. I'll try and come at it from a producer's, like a production standpoint. Um, so to do that, I'll just kind of give a quick overview of the gardens at the ranch. Um, we are part of Heifer International, so we're a large nonprofit um, connecting people to sustainable agriculture to get people, to get folks around the world to a livable wage. Uh, in the U.S., that looks like the farmer training and doing some R&D. Uh, we have a three, three acre certified organic garden. Uh, we have three high tunnels. Uh, this is a kind of what our, our space looks like right now. A uh, half acre market garden, which would be our no till, high intensity, uh, high turnover crops. And then two acres of tractor cultivated uh, crops. And that's um, a walk behind tractor on, um, on rows. Um, so a, a little bit, uh, just a, a different approach to it. Um, we're trying to, uh, emulate systems and adapt systems that small farmers could use without a big investment in land or equipment. Uh, our current markets are some cooperatives in Memphis and Northwest Arkansas, uh, New South and the Food Conservancy. We sell to restaurants, um, though restaurants have been really hard hit through COVID. And so we've kind of almost uh, pivoted entirely away from restaurants um, and then to institutions like schools, uh, colleges. Uh, grocers or harps and Ozark Natural Foods. And then I, I call them boutique retailers. Uh, they're kind of like small family owned groceries uh, that focus on local items and, and that sort of thing. Uh, Bell Urban Farm, uh, Bramble Market, uh, Old Crow. Um, and then our crop prog programs, like what we're trying to focus on, um, you know, we are uh, looking at tr trying to find markets that other farmers are not currently in or products that other farmers currently don't have or um, producing products at times that other mark farmers don't have product. So because we're not nonprofit, we're trying to work with farmers and train them, we don't want to compete head to head. Um, so we kind of envision the market garden as being kind of like a tip of a spear. We want to get into a market and open it up for other farmers to kind of come in behind us and then we'll move on to something else. So uh, root crops have been a big focus for us, um, both in uh, bulk, so 20 pound bag and then packaged a retail bag. Uh, same thing with herbs, doing herbs and packaged um, uh, clamshells. Uh, our high, I call them tunnel crops, which for us is uh, peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, um, and cucumbers. And then uh, our greens, which are romaine, head lettuces, uh, kale and collards. And then we also do cut flowers in bulk. So we sell them, sell cut flowers by the bucket. All right, you can go to the next one. So that, that's what our, our retail bags look like. Um, and this has probably had the most promise for us in terms of getting into a marketplaces where other farmers currently aren't at, but could be. And so we're trying to figure out all the kinks of this kind of production system. So the benefits for school sales, like with this in mind, is that it helps us diversify our market. Uh, like Echo is saying, you know, Sales can be strong in the winter time um, when farmers markets aren't around. Um, it helps us um, move items that we might not be able to put into that retail package. You know, to put something in a in a package like that to sit on a shelf at Harps or ONF, it really has to be top quality. Um, but if a school is just going to chop up the carrots and throw them in a stew, they don't need the most beautiful carrots that I've grown. You know what I mean? Um, and then also helps from a marketing standpoint, uh, like Sarah was saying, you know, the schools will highlight the farmers and tell a little bit about us. And so um, just until this past year, you know, we've had school groups of kids out here regularly um, and kind of helps them connect like, oh, that's, we're going to field trip there. That's also the folks that grew our carrots. Um, 
And then, you know, community support, obviously, you know, farmers care deeply um, about, you know, what people are eating and the health of their community. And so it feels good from a producer standpoint to know that kids are eating healthy food. Um, and then goodwill too. I think there's some social capital towards, you know, people are going to want to support your farm if they see that you are supporting their kids. Um, and so, but yeah, Echo did a great job hitting all those benefits. Um, so I won't get too deep into that. Um, some of the challenges, uh, Sarah, I updated this with a little picture of a tote. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Cause, uh, and to me, that represents one of the challenges of, of selling farm to school is that we had one school that required all their greens be packed in these totes. They're about the size of a shoebox. And I was like, oh my goodness, to do 100 pounds of kale is going to take forever. Um, but now, now we're just using cardboard. Um, so some of the challenges that we've experienced have been too much all at once, too infrequently. Um, so a school might need you know, 200 pounds of kale and then nothing for a month. Um, we haven't been able to get those reliable, like every week I'll take 100 pounds or every week I'll take 50 pounds um, kind of relationships yet. And so it usually is like a dump of produce all at once and then kind of nothing for a while. Um, and it might be in one of the uh, like farmer highlight, uh, highlights, what, I can't remember what, what you called that, um, where they're just like highlighting particular grower um, the different packaging requirements, you know, some of our, we have standardized packaging for most of our retailers and, and restaurants and a, an institution might want something a little bit different. And so that can sometimes be a challenge, like I mentioned with the totes. We'll never, never do that again. Uh, logistics, of just trying to figure out, you know, if you aren't selling to a customer every week, uh, how do we get it up there? You know, that we, uh, Fayetteville Public Schools, we've worked with them and that's been a great relationship, but they're two and a half hours away. And so making sure that we have other deliveries that are uh, that we can be making to, to where we're sending a completely filled truck and it, and it, it makes sense. Um, and also price point too. Um, Conway Public Schools uh, was, was kind enough uh, in a, a meeting that we had with them to share all their prices that they've paid on produce. And so that was helpful to me as a producer to be able to go to there and say, we can do this, we can do this, we can definitely not do this <laughs> and just figure out what prices, uh, price points work. And I think Echo brought up a great point of like, know your price point, what you need to get to make money and, and, and stick to that. And, you know, and to say that, you know, we are selling as local farmers, you know, higher quality product, it's, it's fresher, it's, you know, it's, it's most likely even healthier uh, more nutrient dense food um, than being sitting on a truck for a week. Um, so we can, you know, we can get that price point that we need. Um, participation of schools. We've had a hard time finding uh, schools that are participating. And that is kind of a, I don't know, catch 22 is that you have higher income schools that are more likely to work with producers, but there's not as many farmers around those high income or, you know, schools with a higher tax base. Um, and then where there's farms, those schools tend to be more rural and have a lower tax base and then don't tend to participate in those uh, farm to school programs. Um, also the availability of producers as there's just not a lot of farmers that are at a scale to sell to farm to school. And so that also limits the amount of, um, you know, uh, how much a school can work with a, like one farmer, you know, there might just be something totally new and different to them. So yeah, so the schools that we've worked with have been Conway Public Schools and Fayetteville Public Schools. With Conway, we did uh, micro purchases, so the informal bid, uh, and that was mostly just greens and carrots for kind of like a farmer highlight kind of program or some of the dark leafy greens that they've needed. Uh, those micro purchases are less than 10,000 a year. Um, and with Fayetteville, we actually did a formal bid. Um, so we put in, we'd done micro purchases and. I guess 2018, yeah, and 2019, we did a formal bid um, and uh, supplied some of, those, some of those products and then COVID hit and it completely stopped. So we haven't sold anything to a school and since that happened um, because they were, they completely shifted to uh, 
home delivery. Like when all the kids went home, they were delivering meals to the home. And, you know, from what I've heard from a lot of the schools is that they've had to spend so much more money just on the packaging that they couldn't, you know, afford in the budget to, to be buying local produce. Um, you know, I think that's with the kids back in school, that's going to be um, uh, remedying itself soon. Uh, but from what I've heard, like participation is still down generally. Um, and so, uh, but we, we did it, go ahead and do another bid for this next year. Um, and it's mostly uh, root crops and greens. Uh, put winter squash on there. And that, that's an example of like our B grade. Um, we can send a bunch to them and they can process them or puree them or cube them up. Um, I know the Food Conservancy was actually working on like a flash freezing type program to where we could send B grade and they could flash freeze it for the schools. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so crops that work for us, uh, price point, like looking at that list that I got from the director at Conway Public Schools, maybe only eight of those items could we hit a price point similar or like approaching what they were getting off the truck. And, you know, some things they might be willing to make an exception if something's in peak ripeness and it just makes sense to highlight a local pro product. Um, but some things we just, it wasn't even worth us chasing. Um, so we just chose to make them work within the programs that we currently have, crop programs we currently have, um, because we're just limited on, on labor. Um, so we're really trying to focus in on, on high earning items. Um, and then our surplus items. Uh, so, you know, tomatoes are a good example. Like you never know exactly how many tomatoes you're gonna get, um, you know, and, and you can have just a bumper crop year. And it's great for them to be able to take the surplus uh, to find a school that can work with that. Uh, and then we also have a, a licensed commercial kitchen. Um, the picture in the bottom right is our, is our pack shed. It actually used to be a horse barn and we got it uh, converted into a commercial uh, food manufacturing facility. So we can package ready to eat greens, ready to eat baby carrots, stuff like that. And then we have another commercial kitchen on site where we do our freezing. So we wash and we can actually freeze tomatoes and sell frozen tomatoes or frozen green tomatoes or frozen basil or you know, other things like that. Um, and so, so handling the surplus, uh, those kind of items have worked well. The B grade, like the carrots that are split or you know, really hairy, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. Um, weird shapes or, or too big. Um, to go into our retail bags, we have a market for those. And so that's what we've worked hard at because we're so small, only being three acres, you know, we're trying to get, you know, 95 to 98% of everything we grow to find a market. We don't want to throw anything in the compost. Um, uh, nothing goes to waste. And so that's been really helpful. And then the storage crops too, for like this, this winter time when we tend to be really light on labor. Um, you know, we have everything already washed and bagged and in a cooler. And Fayetteville says they need 500 pounds of tomato, of uh, tomatoes, of uh, carrots. And I can just go pull boxes and just put them on a truck. And, and that, that's worked really well for us. Uh, so the dark leafy greens. Um, so that, that includes romaine lettuce. And someone correct me if I am wrong on that. But I think that includes romaine lettuce, uh, kale, and collards. Um, those have worked for us when we've been able to field pack them. Um, to where we're not having to like take them and put rubber bands and um, go wash and then repack. We can just take kale, you know, rip it off, put it in totes or put it in cardboard and, and, and send it. Um, but a school has to have the capacity to wash it and process it there, um, which kind of gets to what Echo is saying about, you know, some schools have central uh, drop sites and then they ship out the product. But some schools like Fayetteville have a central kitchen and they can actually process a large amount and then send out the processed food to all the schools. So it just depends what school districts you're working with. Um, all the, the, the tunnel crops have worked well for us, um, like snacking peppers, like lunchbox peppers, uh, cucumbers when we just have a glut of cucumbers. Um, and things we want to try more this next year are the frozen items and then lettuces, doing head lettuces. Um, but that's probably just gonna be the romaine lettuce because um, it's just, it's heavy. <laughs> it takes up, it's very heavy for the space uh, that it takes up. Um, so there's our dark leafy greens. Like I said, we, we sell those, we try and field pack as much as we can. 
Uh, so we have carts, we can load those up with cardboard and we're just trying to get as much as we can out. Um, this has worked pretty well for us too, especially in the romaine, because we can just plant them in blocks and harvest it in blocks. And, and that's sold by the pound. Um, it's the only customer we would sell greens by the pound. Um, most of our other retail customers, like for a head of lettuce, you'd, you'd price it by the by each. Um, or kale and collards, we do we sell in bunches. Um, so so it did take some like calculating to figure out what what worked. Um, but yeah, field packing greens worked well for us. Um, and oh, and that picture of the in the greenhouse was in February. So like Echo was saying, being able to get through the winter, you know, and we harvested all that for a school, like that, that really helps to be able to have cash flow in January, February. So the, the root crops, um, we do uh, beets in bulk, uh, the, the, for the schools we do uh, beets in bulk, carrots in bulk, mainly just B grade, because all of our A grade can go into retail bags, um, and then daikon radishes and, uh, and baby radishes. Uh, I think kohlrabi too is promising uh, as like a, if you like jicama, you probably like kohlrabi as like snack sticks. I think that has some opportunity and we grew some like monster kohlrabi last year. So we're going to try that and work with a school on moving some of those because they also store for a really long time. Um, but this is our, this is a, a reefer a shipping container that we converted into a refrigerator. And it's nice to just be able to have, basically we put, um, I think we will wind up putting about 20,000 pounds of root crops in there for the winter. And we can just go and just pull bags. Um, and that that's really nice when we're so limited on, on labor through the winter time that a school can just place an order and we, we have it ready to go. Uh, greenhouse crops, uh, cucumbers, uh, slicing tomatoes, uh, heirlooms might be nice if you have extra the school could take, but really they're looking for the slicers that they can use um, either in a salad bar or to like process in some way. Um, which uh, green tomatoes too, we've even had luck with that uh, when we've just had too many. Um, frozen tomatoes, I think that has potential um, if you have the freezer space and then the lunchbox peppers too uh, have been pretty popular. So that's all I got. Um, this is some of the resources. If you want to know more about what we're doing at Heifer USA, um, we have a Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, and you can see some of our, our videos. Um, we do live streams. Um, we're working on an equipment loan program for farmers that may be on this, on this meeting um, that need access to small tractors or um, uh, caterpillar tunnels, that sort of thing. And we're doing some research and development kind of stuff. And we're trying to get back to in-person conferences and trainings soon-ish at some point when it's safe. <laughs> but that's, that's the plan. What questions have come up for, for all of you on the line? Thank you so much, um, Sean and Echo for your expertise. Uh, Jake jumped in the chat, I'll read it out for us. Said, hey, Sean, I really enjoyed hearing the work you're doing. Is there any consideration in the benefits for CO2 offsetting around transportation or ecosystem services among localized sales? Love the question. Don't know if you have an answer. Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer. <laughs> I have to like read it again. <laughs> uh, I mean, considerations. Um, I, I don't, I mean, you know, that's, that's why we're doing local agriculture, right? Like that's why we're promoting this is to reduce inputs and CO2 <laughs> expenses and stuff for transporting food all over the world. Um, but I'm not sure, I guess what the schools, if the schools consider that benefit that, you know, and it, it well, I forgot what they call it. Um, uh, oh man, negative, externalized negatives, it basically externalized costs. The reason why food is so cheap coming from California because they're not having to pay for the CO2 that they're creating by the transportation. The, 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 the physical, the cost is externalized. And so I don't know, I don't know if schools consider that thing. It'd be great if we did, you know, I think food that is typically subsidized would be a lot more expensive um, if it was having to pay for the environmental harm it causes. Um, and that, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, great, great question. I'll add in to that. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know either on that, Jake. I do know that schools can, on their formal and their informal 
methods, um, so informal being 10,000 to 20,000 per farmer per year, and then the formal being over 20,000, they can create this rubric that's not just looking at the price, but looking at other factors, um, like I was talking about about the farm visit. Um, I've also seen other factors being, you know, like um, women owned farms or minority owned farms as a classification, you can get like an extra couple points here and there. So I don't, I wonder if this might be something that schools could potentially put on their grading scale, but I don't think I've seen it yet happen in Arkansas. Great it, question. Some of the co-ops consider that, like some co-ops and grocery stores, you know, what they consider local or regional, like sometimes it has a mileage associated with it and they'll give you preference if you're in the local region. Yeah, I, that's true. I have seen that with um, schools where it's, they want it delivered within 48 hours of being cut mm -hmm. or within 24 hours of being harvested. So mm -hmm. that's kind of getting at this a bit too, without maybe expressively saying that. Great question. Yeah, good question. Echo, thank you so much for the time that you took to share your story and for all the, um, the work that you've done to make these connections with schools and Sean also thank you so much for your perspective on the production and how you have a different perspective than Echo on different school districts that you've worked with and, and what's working well at Heifer Ranch versus Barn Hill Orchard so just huge shout out to you both because farm to school cannot happen without farmers um, you are the center of this with kids and I'm so thankful that you're both able to share your perspectives today.